I'm going to start here. So it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, who is uh, Professor Mark Humphreys. Mark is a specialist in the history of late antiquity, the period stretching from the third century to the seventh uh, that saw dramatic transformations of the ancient world. These include the collapse of the Roman Empire uh, in the West and the emergence of new states and societies and the disappearance of ancient religions known as paganism and the emergence of new faiths of Christianity and Islam. He studies these transformations in a way that emphasizes connections and interactions between the Mediterranean world and the Roman Empire uh, and neighboring regions of uh, Eurasia and Africa. He's published widely on all aspects of history and culture of the period. He is an editor of the acclaimed Liverpool University Press series, Translated Texts uh, for Historians which produces volumes and sources for, for the period 300 to 800. And he is an area editor of Late Antiquity and Byzantine in the Encyclopedia of Ancient History. He has been the professor of ancient history at Swansea University since 2007, having previously held positions at Maynooth, Manchester, St Andrews and Leicester. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Mark here tonight and to present for the Egypt Centre. And we're very grateful uh, to Mark for offering this talk today. Um, Mark is always an entertaining speaker, so I'm very much looking forward to this. I know a lot of people were put off a little bit by the picture and the title, but uh, we did promise them that it was going to be uh, uh, a good talk. <laughs> so over to you and thanks again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken. I hope you can all hear me okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yep. great. Um, um, sorry, before you start, are you happy to take questions at the end if people yeah, I'm, I'm happy to message them to myself and Ken? Yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, right. Um, uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, it's, um, I mean, I'm very fond of the Egypt Centre and um, very honoured to be asked. I'm not um, a specialist in Egyptian things at all. Um, although, as Ken just said, I work on things that have an impact on Egypt, even if I don't specifically look at them uh, in connection with Egypt. Um, so uh, do bear that in mind when I speak. The other, the other forewarning I should say is if at any point a small face appears at the window behind me, if you've got my face on the screen, uh, don't be alarmed. That's simply my daughter having a look at me, um, which she does rather a lot. Uh, I sometimes get the impression that students think it's some sort of poltergeist when I'm when it happens during lectures. OK, so um, uh, this evening I'm talking about they were jeering at the idols. They, were, they consigned them to the flames, uh, Christians and the Egyptian temples at the end of antiquity. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be looking at is in a very general way is uh, some transformations happening in the temples of Egypt in the period between about 300 and 600. And this is a period of uh, profound religious transformation right across the Mediterranean world um, in that traditional forms of religion disappear uh, and are replaced uh, by Christianity. Um, uh, in Egypt, that uh, history will have a, uh, an additional dimension uh, from uh, the, the late 600s onwards with the uh, arrival uh, of, of the Arabs. Uh, so that's the general um, uh, trajectory of history in the centuries that I'm going to be covering. Uh, what I want to look at is, first of all, I want to look at this seeking out of the idols, which relates to the quotation that I've used for the title of this talk. Um, and uh, we'll look at um, a text that describes the destruction uh, of religious images uh, in uh, Egypt um, in this period. Um, I'm then going to look at some uh, evidence for uh, Christian uh, religious activity in uh, the temples themselves. And I should at this point uh, acknowledge that I'm going to be very grateful to Ken, who a number of years ago uh, shared with me a number of photographs that he'd taken uh, of signs of uh, Christian uh, activity in uh, the temples. Uh, and then uh, the main question I want to answer is just how reliable are the Christian accounts that we have of the destruction of uh, Egyptian temples and the destruction of images? How reliable uh, are those accounts? 
uh, and do we need to treat them with a certain amount of caution? Um, so the first uh, thing that I'm going to be talking about, this seeking out of the idols, uh, I'm going to talk about a text which doesn't come from Egypt at all. Um, uh, the form in which it survives comes from Syria. Um, uh, it is written in the local uh, Syrian and North Mesopotamian language of Syriac. Uh, and it comes from a work by an individual called Zachariah Scholasticus. Uh, and it's a work that he wrote defending an individual called Severos of Antioch. He originally wrote that work in Greek, so far as we can make out, but it only survives in this translation uh, into the local uh, Syriac language. Uh, now, who is uh, Severos uh, of Antioch? He was the Christian patriarch, that is the Christian bishop uh, of Antioch between 512 and 538. Uh, and he was a major player uh, in, uh, in church politics uh, in his day. Uh, and because he was a major player, he, um, uh, he uh, cultivated a, a number of enemies uh, as a result of his interventions. And those enemies sought to discredit um, Severos by claiming that at an earlier stage in his life, uh, when he had be a, he'd been a student in Alexandria in Egypt, he had been consorting with pagans. He'd actually been participating in pagan rituals. So this is um, uh, probably in the 480s uh, when uh, Severos was at uh, Alexandria. So these accusations were made against Severos and Zacharias Scholasticus wrote this uh, defense uh, of uh, Severos. Now, interestingly, it, it contains some information directly relevant to uh, religious rivalry in Egypt in that it includes a long account um, which goes in the, 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 the standard English translation goes over several pages. I won't do all of it this evening, uh, but it includes a material about um, uh, an individual from Alexandria called Paralios. Uh, Paralios had been a, uh, a had been a pagan uh, from Alexandria in the 480s um, who converted to Christianity. So embedded within this work, um, uh, which defends Severos of Antioch, is this additional bit of information about this pagan convert to Christianity at Alexandria called Paralios. And uh, what that account, what, the reason why that account is interesting is that it describes gangs of monks uh, going around the villages in the Nile Delta in the vicinity of Alexandria, looking for hidden cult images of the pagan gods and destroying them. And this is described as being uh, undertaken at the direction uh, of the patriarch, the, bishop, the Christian bishop of Alexandria, uh, Peter Mongos, who uh, was bishop twice. He was bishop briefly in 477 uh, and then again from 482 to 489. The reason why he's bishop twice has to do with complex empire-wide uh, church politics. Anyway, this is uh, what uh, this extract tells us uh, about what was happening. He says, it says that Petros, the archbishop, so Petros Mongos of Alexandria, uh, provided us, that is, um, uh, Paralios and his, his friends with some of his clergy and gave instructions in a letter to those monks living in the monastery known as of the Tabernesiots, um, which is situated in Canopos, uh, to assist us in rooting out and getting rid of the gods of the demons uh, belonging to the pagans. So here we have the bishop directing monks to uh, find images of the gods. Uh, it says that after having prayed for an appropriate outcome, uh, they arrived at a place called Minuthus, which is in, uh, which is quite close to Canopus and therefore is now under uh, the sea. Um, and we came to a building which was at that time inscribed, inscribed with pagan characters. And that seems to be a reference to uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions. In one of the recesses, a double wall had been built inside which uh, the images had been concealed. Um, uh, a single narrow means of access to them had been made resembling a window through this, uh, the priest, that means a pagan priest, used to enter and perform the sacrifices. So there's this hidden chamber within this building uh, where, according to this um, text, uh, images of the gods are 
um, hidden. The text describes how that, uh, describes in rather elaborate way the way in which the uh, the entrance had been hidden, uh, but it's it, but how Peralios nevertheless dis discovered it. Uh, and having discovered this um, this entrance, we are told that um, having crossed himself with the sign of Christ's cross, uh, he revealed the entrance that had been blocked up for the occasion with stones and recent masonry. In other words, what had happened was that local pagans had heard that this gang of monks was on its way to uh, Manuthus, and they thought, oh, right, we better conceal the entrance. So they had freshly uh, blocked up the entrance, uh, which I think gave the game away a bit. Um, uh, Peralios then asked the Tabernesiots, uh, who had come along with, uh, with us to help us for a pickaxe, in this way, he made ready for one of them to open up the part that had recently been built and thus to uncover its former appearance. So they destroy this concealed entrance. The Tabernesiot, that is this monk, then entered. On seeing a multitude of idols and catching sight of an altar covered with blood, he cried out in Coptic, there is but one God, uh, uttering this as if to chase away the error of this uh, polytheism. Um, then we get a description of what's um, uh, found in this concealed chamber um, as they uh, hand out uh, the, um, the images of the gods that they find out in there. Uh, first, he handed out the idol of Kronos, uh, which was entirely spattered with blood, and then likewise all the other idols of the demons, a, mi a mixed bunch of all sorts of things, even dogs, cats, monkeys, crocodiles and reptiles. For these two were formerly worshipped by the Egyptians. Of the rebel monster carved in wood, uh, as it seems to me those who worship it, or rather the monster who wishes to be honoured in this way, are hinting at the rebellion of the protoclasts, that is Adam and Eve, which took place by the monster's council by means of the tree of knowledge. So this is identifying one of these as the serpent uh, from the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Uh, it goes on to provide some detail on where these images are supposed to have come from. It, said, it, it says, it is said that these idols had been surreptitiously re been removed from the temple of Isis that formerly existed in Memphis by the priests of, of the time, when the pagans felt that their cause was losing its strength and paganism was dying out. Accordingly, they hid them in the manner just described in the vain and empty expectation and hoped that they would not be caught. Some of the idols had already deteriorated in parts because of their great age. These we consigned to the flames right there and then in Manuthus. Uh, and then it describes how they, um, um, uh, this is the bit which I quoted, we consigned some of them to the fire uh, while other we, others we made a list of. These were ones of bronze elaborately worked or of marble and various likenesses. Uh, along with the bronze altar and the wooden monster, uh, we sent a list, the list uh, to Petros, our Lord Jesus Christ, Bishop, asking him to instruct us what to do. And then the, what happens then is that these um, idols are brought to Alexandria uh, and there's a great bonfire uh, in which um, uh, the, they are consigned uh, um, to the flames. So what are we to make of a story uh, like this in a text written in Syria, written in the vicinity of Antioch, many miles from Egypt? Um, uh, and uh, a number of decades after the events are supposed to have taken place. Um, I suppose on the face of it, there are some elements that look uh, plausible. There is a certain amount of topographical precision uh, describing uh, places in the Nile Delta. Uh, and then there's this reference to the god, gods with animal attributes. But uh, alongside that, there are clear elements of literary embellishment, the altar covered with covered in blood, that's a standard feature of these anti-pagan uh, Christian accounts. This is what makes these uh, these altars so uh, uh, revolting is that they are covered in or spattered with blood. Uh, we've, give, we've got um, some of the gods being given Greek names, uh, Kronos, for example, here, and also the interpretation of one of the images as the serpent from the Garden of Eden. Uh, we've got emphasis on the uh, power of the sign of the cross as a way of sort of warding off the demonic influence, the demonic power uh, of these images. Uh, we also, uh, I think very significantly, have a very uh, clear emphasis that this is a well-organised um, uh, campaign under the leadership 
uh, of the Bishop of, um, of Alexandria. The relationship between the Bishop of Alexandria and the monks wasn't always an easy one. So the fact that you have the monks described here uh, as um, doing the bidding of the bishop um, uh, perhaps suggests that this is a, uh, is a clearly um, uh, organised, uh, you know, it's an account designed to show uh, a harmonious picture uh, of the um, Egyptian uh, church. Um, so these prompts us to ask, you know, how much can we trust uh, these sorts of pictures? So um, one way of uh, answering that question is to, is to turn uh, to look uh, at um, the, um, uh, the temples themselves and see, can we identify um, uh, some uh, images uh, or some uh, evidence for Christian activity? Uh, so I want to look now at some evidence that we have for the destruction um, of images in temples uh, and what evidence we have for it. And the examples that I'm going to look at um, come um, from uh, the Ramesseum, uh, from the Babel Amara Gate Karnak, and I'm very grateful to Ken for sharing um, some photographs uh, of this with me. Uh, and also at Medinat Habu, and again, thanks to Ken uh, for the images that he's provided. So we'll look at some examples there. Uh, and one of the things I want to highlight is that there seem to be some distinctive Egyptian characteristics in the destruction of images um, that um, are, are highlighted by comparing it uh, with evidence that we have from other parts of the Christian world at this time, looking at laws of Christian emperors and the destruction of cult images from other uh, places, um, uh, which seem to emphasize one particular uh, strategy, the evidence from the Egyptian temples points at some other uh, things. Uh, so let's start at the Ramesseum, uh, and there's a picture uh, aerial picture of it to remind me of what it looks like. I, I, I have been there, but it was about 35 years ago um, before I uh, was even a student. Um, and what we've got um, uh, on the columns um, in this sort of hyperstyle hall here uh, is occasional bits of evidence of um, um, the mutilation uh, of reliefs. Um, and what you can see uh, on this um, relief is that the face uh, of this figure has been hacked away. Um, you can also see uh, that there has been some damage uh, to the arms uh, and also, uh, and this is something that we're going to see quite a lot, uh, there has been damage done uh, to the feet. Um, and in terms of who is responsible for this, underneath uh, we have two uh, tau-shaped crosses, that is T-shaped crosses, uh, like our capital T uh, shaped crosses, uh, which looks uh, like a um, uh, Christian uh, um, bit of uh, carving done on this column. So um, from the uh, scholarship that's been done on this, it suggests that what you have are the Christians going in, putting up some images of crosses, but also destroying faces, arms and feet uh, of um, uh, uh, the reliefs. Now, one of the places uh, where we can see this uh, pretty spectacularly, and this is um, all, almost all from the photographs provided by Ken, uh, is in this corner uh, of the temple precinct at Karnak, where you have um, uh, a couple of gates uh, built uh, by uh, Ptolemy III uh, Euergetes. Um, and in particular, it's um, I think I've got this right, it's that gate, I think. Uh, I've worked this, out, worked this out on the basis of the, the pylons that I can see in the background in the, in the following uh, photographs. So this is an area of the temple that had been developed in the Ptolemaic period uh, in the third century BC. Uh, now at some stage in the Christian period, uh, it seems to be uh, on the receiving end uh, of um, uh, um, some iconoclastic activity. Um, so that's uh, the, um, the gate, uh, uh, you can see it um, uh, uh, there. Um, you've got, uh, this is sort of, uh, so if I go back to the previous one, if we look at that, you can see that there are actually signs of, uh, if you look very carefully, you can see signs of um, uh, chisels being applied to that. 
Um, but on the interior phase, we've got quite a lot of evidence. Um, you can see, um, again, if you look at the at the feet, if you look at the arms and if you look at the faces, even at this distance, you can begin to see uh, traces uh, of uh, the um, uh, of activity uh, against them. Uh, even clearer here, if you look at this bottom image here, you can see that of these three figures here, the feet have all been carved out similarly here, similarly here, even up, up high up here, there, there are people going up and hacking away the feet, uh, the arms, uh, and uh, the um, uh, and the faces uh, of uh, these images. Um, and again, uh, this one in particular um, shows a very uh, clear uh, image uh, of what's going on. Uh, and here is a, a, a detailed um, photograph uh, of it I got from a publication, uh, which shows uh, very clearly how there's been very deliberate destruction uh, of the uh, faces. Um, you can see uh, of these uh, figures, uh, it's very clear that the, the faces have all been gouged out. Uh, the hands have also been gouged out. Uh, the, um, uh, the feet uh, have been gouged out uh, as well. Um, and uh, from what I can make out from the scholarship that's been done on this, it's a suggestion that they're getting rid of the um, the icon, the face of the uh, of the uh, of the figure, uh, they're getting rid of the hands through which the uh, the figure would perform its actions, but also getting rid of the feet uh, in order uh, to um, prevent this figure from moving around. Uh, even in the case of this one, which looks to be um, uh, an image of a statue, uh, and other parts of this of this um, this gate similarly show uh, this sort of activity. Uh, you can see that it has been pretty systematically um, uh, um, done over uh, with um, uh, all sorts uh, of uh, faces, arms um, and hands and feet, uh, all um, uh, quite deliberately uh, attacked. Uh, so the evidence from uh, uh, from uh, the Ramesse and the rev evidence from this uh, gate uh, at um, at Karnak shows these different types of attacks that are being made uh, on uh, these um, uh, these images. Um, uh, another one uh, another one that shows this uh, is from uh, Medina at Habu. Uh, again, uh, these are photographs that Ken has supplied me with. Uh, where again we can see uh, that the um, uh, that the images have been um, uh, uh, attacked. Uh, you can see um, a figure uh, appear where the oops sorry uh, where the, um, the face has been hacked out. Uh, but also notice that you have um, also very clear signs of these Christian symbols. You've got crosses there, uh, another cross there. Uh, crosses there. So uh, lots of um, uh, evidence for destruction uh, and lots of evidence uh, for um, uh, the uh, deliberate effort to obliterate the pre-existing religious images and to put new Christian, Christian symbols uh, in their place. Now um, uh, one of the things uh, that's, that's happening here is of course something that we can see right across uh, the Roman Empire uh, at this time, uh, which is um, uh, uh, Christians taking action um, to destroy uh, pagan uh, cult centres. Um, we hear about it in uh, numerous narratives of Christian saints um, you know, from uh, all parts of the empire, not just Egypt. We hear about um, uh, Christian monks, Christian bishops, uh, taking um, uh, actions against um, uh, pagan uh, pagan shrines. Um, a, a lot of this was done at the initiative of these local Christian leaders, or you know, by you know, at their own initiative without any sort of imperial control. Um, but we do hear about um, the emperors uh, making um, um, uh, uh, decrees that. Uh, pagan images should be uh, removed. Um, 
this, for example, is the text of a law uh, issued in the middle of the fifth century. We know from it from uh, that the end there's a dating clause down here, which shows us that it was um, uh, issued on a date that we would understand as the 14th of November, 435 CE. Uh, it is issued by the then ruling emperors. There are two emperors at this point, uh, one in the east, uh, one in the west. Um, uh, in this case, it's the eastern emperor Theodosius II uh, issuing the law. He issues it in the name of his western co-emperor uh, to maintain the idea that there are uh, that there is this sort of um, uh, unity to the empire, even if there are two different emperors. Uh, and it's is issued to a uh, regional official uh, called the Praetorian Prefect, uh, who um, is called Isidorus. And Isidorus had responsibility for a collection of provinces uh, in the Middle East and in Egypt. So he was responsible uh, for affairs in Egypt. So this is a law which would have had application uh, in Egypt because Isidorus, who got the law, uh, was um, uh, had oversight of Egyptian affairs. Um, now it uh, it describes um, that um, uh, what what the emperors want to happen. They they say that we forbid all persons of criminal pagan mind from the accursed immolation of victims, from damnable sacrifices, and from all other practices that are prohibited by the authority of the more ancient sanctions. In fact, this is one of only a, of of uh, a couple of dozen laws in which Christian emperors condemn uh, pagan rituals and the, the traditional forms of temple worship. Um, uh, what they are saying is, though on this occasion, is that we command that all their sanctuaries, fanes, temples and shrines, even if, uh, if even now they remain entire, shall be destroyed by command of the magistrates, that's of the towns and and cities and villages around uh, the Roman Empire and shall be purified by the erection of the sign of the venerable Christian religion. In other words, the, um, the setting up of a cross uh, will be um, sort of somehow set up um, uh, on, uh, on these pagan sanctuaries to show that Christianity has done away uh, with this previous form of religious error. Uh, and it says all men shall know that if it should appear by suitable proof before a competent judge that any person has mocked this law, uh, he shall be punished with death. So anyone who sneers at this, this enactment will actually, is actually liable to the death penalty. Uh, and that indicates how seriously these emperors are taking it. Uh, however, just again, notice the date. This is from the 430s. This is over a century uh, since the um, the Roman Emperor Constantine ha uh, has converted to Christianity. So it takes a while uh, for uh, the uh, Roman emperors actually to condemn traditional temple worship um, and to uh, uh, order the destruction of temples and the setting up uh, of, um, of Christian uh, symbols and also to make this um, a crime. Anyone who rejects this, who, who sneers at this legislation, who marks this legislation uh, will be punished uh, with death. Um, so uh, what we're getting is a is a clear indication that you know, this is something that the emperors are doing right around the empire. Uh, and we do have evidence for this sort of thing. This is a particularly well-known example. Uh, it's a, a bust of Germanicus currently. Um, he's an early imperial prince. Um, um, uh, this bust is currently in the uh, British Museum. I, Last time I checked, they were pretty sure it was from Egypt. Uh, it probably comes from a shrine of the imperial cult, of the, the cult of the worship of the Roman emperors as gods. Uh, and what you can see very clearly, if you look at the forehead, um, it looks like uh, Germanicus has had a, a, an Ash Wednesday experience. He's had this cross carved in his forehead, uh, which uh, we find in many uh, cult images, uh, not just from Egypt, but from right around uh, the uh, the Mediterranean uh, world. So what we can see is that um, the physical evidence from Egypt um, uh, uh, shows us that what's going, in, going on in Egypt is not dissimilar to what's going on in other parts of this Christian Roman Empire. Um, the law of 435, as we've just seen, uh, provides evidence of more general um, uh, 
uh, measures against pagan worship in various parts of um, the east of the empire and presumably the, the aspiration is that this would happen right across the empire. However, the evidence that we have from Egypt um, shows that there are these specifically Egyptian features in the way that images are defaced. Uh, we do get the placing of crosses, which we've seen is one of the things that the emperors want to happen. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, in the Egyptian temples, we have very consistently um, this uh, defacing, not just of the, of the heads and hands uh, of um, images of gods and pharaohs, uh, but also of the feet. And that, that, that destruction of the feet seems to be very, uh, quite a distinctive feature uh, of what's going on. Uh, in Egypt. So on the one hand we have evidence from writings like that of Zacharias Scholasticus um, uh, on um, what's going on in Minuthus uh, in the 480s and we have the evidence from the temples of Egypt uh, itself. So how do we make sense of this? Do we just sort of accept you know it all as sort of telling uh, basically uh, the, um, uh, the, the same sort of story? Um, so what I want to do in uh, this, this is going to be the, the third part uh, of uh, and final part of the talk, is to try and make sense of this evidence and trying to rationalise uh, this evidence. Because as we've seen, uh, when we looked at the account of what Paralios is doing at Minuthus, uh, there is evidence to suggest that it's, you know, there's some sort of exaggeration going on, particularly in terms of this harmonious relationship between the bishops of Alexandria and the monks. Um, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to look at um, another Alexandrian bishop. Uh, this is one from the end of the fourth century called Theophilus, and look at the one of the most celebrated temple destructions from Egypt uh, for, for the whole of this period, which is the destruction of the Serapeum uh, at Alexandria. Now, this will bring us uh, to, the, um, to the image that Ken talked about uh, right at the beginning. Uh, I then want to move our attention uh, from um, uh, Alexandria in the north uh, all the way south to the southern frontier of Egypt to, to look at two stories from Philae uh, on the southern, uh, the, the southern frontier, uh, one relating to a bishop called Macedonius, uh, who we are told um, in one of these Christian accounts is the first bishop uh, of Philae. Uh, and we have a, a story there of the mass conversion of of Philae to, to Christianity. Uh, we then also have um, an account uh, from about 200 years later uh, of the Emperor Justinian uh, somehow being involved in the destruction uh, of the temples at Philae. Uh, and having done that, I'm going to finish up by looking at um, another story, which this in time involves a monk and a mummy case, uh, which uh, seems an appropriate thing with which to finish. Um, because it's quite a good story. So um, let's start with Bishop Theophilus uh, at Alexandria, um, who is um, uh, associated with one of the most famous temple destructions, not just in Egypt, but in the whole of the Mediterranean uh, world. And this is the destruction in probably in about the year 391 of the Serapeum, the Temple of Serapis uh, in uh, Alexandria. Uh, and this is something that um, Theophilus is celebrated for, uh, not least in the image that um, uh, was uh, circulated with the promotional material uh, for this lecture, uh, which is from a papyrus, uh, which is of a chronicle, a city chronicle produced at Alexandria in the fifth or sixth century. There's some debate about uh, exactly when it belongs, but it's, it's after Theophilus's time. Um, it is a rather remarkable work. It's very fragmentary, as I hope you can see in the, uh, the photograph here. Uh, you have the text uh, in, in Greek, um, and then the margins are filled with, um, uh, with images uh, of the uh, illustrating the events that it describes. And the, the important one to notice here is this image here, which shows uh, Theophilus triumphing over uh, the Temple of Serapis, over the Serapeum uh, at Alexandria. Uh, what we have here is a figure 
uh, holding a book with a cross on it. Uh, this is a cop. This is an image of Theophilus himself, um, uh, 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 holding uh, a copy of the scriptures. So this is the Bishop of Alexandria uh, holding uh, a copy of the scriptures, uh, and he's standing on top of a building, uh, inside which you can see a figure uh, with what looks like a sort of flower pot uh, on his head. Uh, and that very clearly, as we can see in the next slide, is the image of the god Serapis, the god who was uh, worshipped uh, at uh, the Serapeum. He's a sort of um, syncretistic version of um, Egyptian gods and Greek gods um, devised in the Ptolemaic period. Um, but the image that we get underneath uh, Theophilus's feet uh, of this figure with this sort of pot uh, on his head, you can see um, is um, um, is uh, uh, it parallels uh, the known iconography uh, of uh, Serapis, as we can see in this bronze bust uh, from the second century, uh, and uh, also this rather fine panel painting uh, of Serapis uh, from about a hundred uh, CE. So clearly, what we've got depicted uh, on uh, uh, in this illustration from this Alexandrian chronicle is one of the most celebrated um, uh, destructions of a uh, pagan temple anywhere in the Mediterranean world, uh, and that is the, the destruction of the Serapeum uh, at uh, Alexandria. Uh, anyone who's seen the film Agra, you will know that this is the, uh, the episode with which part one of the film ends. Now, in the way that that's remembered, we can see in the papyrus uh, of that uh, Alexandrian chronicle that there, you know, there, there's this sort of striking image which commemorates um, uh, Theophilus's destruction of the Serapeum. Um, in the imagination, in the Christian historical imagination, this soon came to be associated with other events at Alexandria uh, that were uh, associated with the suppression uh, of paganism and indeed of pagans. So, um, uh, in particular, there are two events which tend to be linked uh, in this, um, uh, this memory. There's the destruction of the Serapeum in 391, and then the murder of a, of a female pagan teacher of philosophy called Hypatia, she was also a philosopher in her own right, uh, in 415. And these are often presented as um, uh, linked events, almost as if the um, destruction of the Serapeum by Theophilus uh, in 391 um, it begins a process that is then concluded in 415 uh, when um, Hypatia uh, is, uh, is murdered. Now, uh, in the case of what we hear about happening in 391, we're told that uh, the, the Christian sources all tell us that Theophilus was the one who masterminded the destruction of this temple. And to indicate that um, his victory over the pagan gods was complete, uh, he arranged for a monastery to be established on the site uh, of this destroyed temple. And this monastery was later dedicated in the name of John the Baptist. Uh, we're then told that a number of years uh, later, um, Theophilus continued to be Bishop of Alexandria uh, until 412. Following his death in 412, he was succeeded by his nephew as Bishop of Alexandria. Uh, his nephew was called Cyril. And a few years into Cyril's uh, episcopate, uh, we have the violence that leads to the death uh, of the pagan philosopher Hypatia. Um, uh, and as I say, these two events uh, come to be uh, associated um, uh, in the Christian historical memory as the beginning and end, as it were, of the, um, uh, the obliteration of paganism at Alexandria. And we can see this in a seventh century um, chronicle, John of Nicu, it's, it's preserved in, Ethiop in Ethiopian language, um, but it describes um, the, uh, here it's describing the, the death of uh, Hypatia. Um, it says they tore off her clothing and dragged her uh, through the streets uh, until she uh, died. Then they carried her to a place called, named Cineron. They burned her body with fire. 
know what else they were going to burn it with. Anyway, uh, and all the people surrounded the patriarch Cyril and named him the new Theophilus, for he had destroyed the last remains of idolatry in the city. So there's this very strong emphasis uh, in the Christian accounts uh, with um, uh, uh, on the role of the bishop uh, in overseeing the destruction of paganism. In the case of Theophilus, with the destruction of the Serapeum, in the case of Cyril, with the uh, death of Hypatia. Um, how this looks on the ground, though, um, is a little bit different. Um, as we can see, if we look at um, uh, such ar archaeological evidence as there is uh, for uh, the uh, destruction of the Serapeum, um, we uh, this is an image, uh, this map of, uh, of Alexandria, uh, and the Serapeum is down in this uh, southwestern uh, corner uh, of, um, uh, of, the, of the city. Um, and the excavations uh, of uh, the site, um, uh, the excavations were conducted from the 19th century through to the early first half of the 20th century, have revealed uh, the, um, uh, the 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 site of the Serapeum, you can see from the scale, it, it's pretty huge. I mean, this is a scale of uh, up to 40 meters. So you can get a, a sense of just how big uh, the, uh, the precinct um, uh, is. Uh, the interesting thing is, though, that when we look for this, uh, you know, we, when we look at the site for signs of what the Christians did to it, uh, we find that the remains of the early Christian church are sort of found not over the whole site, uh, but rather on one uh, one edge uh, of it in the um, in the, uh, the sort of southwestern corner of the site, there is evidence there uh, for this uh, for this Christian church. So that goes against the sort of um, image that we have uh, in uh, the um, uh, the documentary text and the in the literary narratives, um, and suggests that you know these literary narratives may not always be as reliable as we might want them to be. So the Christian sources then um, uh, are written after the event uh, and they seek to um, uh, emphasize the role played by the Bishop Theophilus. And in that respect, they're quite similar to the account that we saw earlier of uh, Bishop, the Bishop Peter Mongus uh, involved in the destruction of the um, pagan images at, um, at Menuthus. Um, and um, those Christian sources don't quite tally with uh, what can be deduced from the archaeology, which shows that rather than having a Christian building built on top of the site of the, of the Serapeum precinct, it was built to one side. So th that's not as neat uh, an image of Christianity obliterating um, uh, the, uh, the pre-existing pagan um, shrine. Um, but it seems to point to a slightly messier reality. Um, and we can see that this is a pattern uh, that is found in various places. Uh, I want to look at a couple of examples now from the far south of Egypt uh, relating uh, to Philae. Uh, both of them come from a Coptic text, um, The Histories of the Monks of Upper Egypt, uh, by an individual called uh, Paphnutius. Uh, which is a work written in, con in, in Coptic. Uh, and the extract that I'm going to look at here is from a lengthy uh, episode. I'm only give you, going to give you a, a few bits uh, about um, the first bishop of uh, Philae, an individual called Macedonius. He's, he's sent there as, a, as an imperial official. He, he wants to find where he can worship as a Christian. He's told that there's nowhere. So he goes back to Alexandria where he's made Bishop of Philae uh, and sent to Philae with the job of uh, obliterating its pagan shrines and um, replacing them, uh, replacing uh, paganism with Christianity. Um, in uh, the account that we get, we're told that um, Macedonius reports how uh, he went to Philae and he saw the local pagans going into their temples and worshipping a certain god, certain birds they call the falcon inside some kind of mechanical device. We're not entirely sure uh, what uh, they have in mind here. Uh, then it happened after some days um, that um, uh, Macedonius goes into the courtyard of the temple and he hears that the priest of the temple had left Philae on business 
and had left the care of the temple to his two sons who were performing the, the various temple liturgies. Um, they would take turns offering sacrifices to the idol. Uh, Macedonius uh, goes up to them and he says, I'd like to offer a sacrifice to God today. And the two sons say, come and offer it. That's because in the version that they heard, there was no distinction between a, a sacrifice to God and a sacrifice to the God. Um, it all sounded the same to them. Um, so they assume that Macedonius wants to offer it to their, to their falcon uh, inside the temple. Um, so one of them went inside and ordered all the preparations to be made uh, for um, uh, the um, uh, uh, for the sacrifice to take place. They sort of uh, wood laid on the altar and fire kindled beneath it. Um, and um, at this point, uh, Macedonius um, goes into where the mechanical device is, uh, removes the falcon and chops off its head and threw it upon uh, the fire. So um, he then left the temple and went away. So here we, again, we have one of these stories of a, of a Christian bishop going into a pagan shrine and destroying uh, the cult image. Um, as I say, the, the story goes on at some length. Um, uh, there, uh, we're told that the sons, when they discovered that what Macedonius had done, were terrified uh, and fled from Philae because they didn't want to be there when daddy got home and discovered that they destroyed, that this Christian had come in and destroyed their, their cult image. Um, however, the sons are tracked down in the desert by Macedonius, who is shown where, they're, where, where they've gone uh, by a miraculous vision, a uh, vision sent to him by God. Uh, we're told that the pagans plotted against Macedonius to try and get rid of him because of the uh, great insult uh, that uh, he had um, uh, perpetrated to their local uh, cult centre. Uh, but then there was another miracle that happened. There is a, we're told that there's a local uh, bunch of nomads come by uh, and there is a camel with a, with a, uh, which is lame in one leg, has a broken leg, um, and Macedonius miraculously cures this camel. And seeing that he's able to pr perform this miraculous cure, we're told that the inhabitants of Philae, including the temple priest, acknowledge that Macedonius has this sort of special divine power. Uh, and then we're told uh, that the people uh, of Philae came to him in a body with joy and gladness and he baptised them. Uh, he first of all baptised the priest and he baptised him, gave him uh, the baptismal name of Jacob. And then it says afterwards uh, he baptised um, the entire population of the city, men and women and little children. There was not a single person left who was not baptised on this single day. Uh, so here we have a story then uh, which talks about a bishop going in to the temple destroying the image uh, and the story reaches its climax with the mass conversion uh, of the people of Philae uh, to um, uh, Christianity. Uh, we'll come back to how reliable that may be in a moment. Uh, and I want to look at another story told about Philae uh, which dates to about a century later uh, from uh, the reign of the um, Emperor Justinian. So that should be the Church of San Vitale in Ravenna, not the Church of San Vitale. Anyway, here we have a description in the major historian of the age of Justinian Procopius uh, in his account of Justinian's wars. He's, uh, he's talking about the, um, uh, the Blemies, the, uh, the nomadic barbarians on the southern frontier of Egypt. Uh, and he says that these barbarians retained the temples on Philae right down to my day, uh, but the Emperor Justinian decided to destroy them. Uh, accordingly, Narses destroyed the temples on the Emperor's orders, held the priests under guard and sent the statues to Byzantium, to the imperial capital at Constantinople. Uh, so we have a bit of a problem here. Uh, surely this shouldn't have been necessary. So there's the face at the window behind me, just in case anyone is. Uh, alarmed and thinks it's a poltergeist. Um, um, uh, you know, we're told that Macedonius had affected this conversion, so why do we have uh, this um, continued uh, presence of non-Christian worship uh, at Philae a uh, hundred years later? This hints that there's something not entirely right. Also, what about this destruction of the temples? Well, uh, of course, the temples at Philae uh, have, have been moved um, uh, because of the, uh, the construction of the uh, of the dams and so on, uh, but I still think we you'd have to say that on the basis of what you can see there today, 
Um, Justinian ought to be rather disappointed in what his officials were getting up to on the southern frontier of Egypt. If he thought that they were destroying the temples, they've done a singularly bad job. But, does, uh, but perhaps destruction um, uh, of the buildings entirely uh, isn't what we should be thinking of. By destruction, it, seem, it may well be the case uh, that what we're dealing with uh, is, the, um, uh, is the destruction of, of them as pagan cult centres or as potential pagan cult centres and the replacement of them as, um, as places which can be used for Christian worship. Uh, and certainly there is evidence for um, uh, Christianization or, or of Christian Christianity at, um, uh, at Philae and the conversion of parts of the temple, at least, into a church. Um, we've got a photograph here. I think this one comes from Ken as well, which shows an altar uh, and a recess. And in both cases, you can see um, uh, an image, uh, uh, images of the cross. Uh, and then on the um, on the on the, on the gateway uh, on the door jamb leading into uh, the um, the temple, you can see this image uh, of the goddess. Um, again, you can see uh, destruction of the arm. Uh, you can see some uh, evidence of destruction of the feet. But notice here that there is this uh, huge cross uh, carved where the face of the goddess uh, would have been. And this seems to be a uh, all uh, associated with a conversion of the building into a Christian church. Uh, and this is attested by inscriptions. There are inscriptions on the site here at Philae, uh, all of which suggest that it was done uh, in the sixth century. So, that, so there is something happening at Philae in the sixth century, even if it is not the destruction of the temple as Procopius would like us uh, to um, uh, uh, believe. So how would we to make sense of these uh, different stories uh, in the different sources uh, that we have uh, about Philae. Uh, well, uh, we have on the one hand, the story of Macedonius um, re related by Paphnutius, which suggests sometime around 400 uh, that there was a mass conversion uh, of uh, the um, inhabitants of Philae uh, to, um, uh, 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 to Christianity. Um, uh, from Procopius about a century and a half later, uh, we have uh, an account which suggests a violent and sudden destruction of the temple and uh, its replacement with a with a Christian place of worship uh, under Justinian. Uh, in other words, what unites these stories, and we can see it also with the stories told about Theophilus in Alexandria and with Peter Mongus um, uh, directing uh, activities at, um, at Manuthus in the Delta, is an emphasis on these sort of dramatic episodes of confrontation um, and uh, the obliteration uh, of the pre-existing sites. However, as we've seen, the temple uh, continues to stand uh, and certainly there is evidence from uh, inscriptions and graffiti uh, of um, um, uh, continued uh, traditional uh, activities going on at the temples at Philae uh, right down uh, to the middle uh, of the fifth century, down to the 450s, we have uh, by that stage, we have, I think it's a, it's a graffito which tells us uh, of somebody invoking um, uh, Isis at, at that point. So on the one hand, we've got stories that emphasize the roles played by, um, uh, by Christian leaders in dramatic episodes of uh, conversion. And on the other hand, we have evidence which suggests that certainly there is there are things going on in the temples, but it's perhaps going on at a rather more patchy, perhaps more gradual rate uh, than these dramatic stories uh, would uh, have us uh, uh, believe. Uh, so to uh, bring this all to a conclusion, uh, I want to finish with one other story, um, which comes from a collection of sayings. This is of famous stories told about the monks living in the desert in the desert. The, it's a, um, a text known as the Apophegmata Patrum, the sayings of the fathers. Um, this comes from the alphabetical collection where they are organized alphabetically by the name uh, of, the, um, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the monk that they're associated with. So this is the 13th story uh, associated with a monk called Macarius. Um, it, it also happens uh, in the Delta uh, and we're told uh, in the story, one day Abba Macarius, Abba simply means 
uh, father, not that he's a devotee of Scandinavian Eurovision winners. Uh, one day, Abu Macarius went up from Skatus to Terranutha, so this is again in the Delta, uh, and went into the temple to sleep. Now there were some old coffins of the pagans there. I'm not entirely sure what sort of temple this is with coffins in it. Taking one, he put it under his head and used it as a pillow. Um, the devils, seeing this, his audacity, were filled with jealousy. And to make him afraid, they called out, as though addressing a woman, Hey, you, come and have a bath with us. It seems that they're addressing whoever it is is inside the coffin. Another devil replied from beneath him, that's from within the coffin, and said, uh, as they were among the dead, he says, I can't come out. I've got a stranger on top of me. This is a reference to Macarius using the coffin uh, as a pillow. Uh, but the old man, uh, Macarius, was not afraid. On the contrary, he knocked on the coffin with assurance, saying, uh, awake with, and go into the darkness if you can. Uh, and hearing this, the devils began to cry out with all their might. You have overcome us. And filled with the confusion, they fled. So here we have another story uh, of one of these Christian heroic figures and the way that Christian heroic figures show their spirituality, show their holiness, is by being able to um, uh, uh, perform these dramatic acts against, um, uh, against demons and the traditional gods uh, are uh, uh, regarded uh, as uh, demons. Uh, so this story of the monk and the mummy case sort of like sums up the problem uh, with the sorts of sources that we're dealing with. Um, in that uh, we know that between 300 and 600, Egypt, like much of the Near East and the Mediterranean world, sees this shift from uh, traditional religion, what we call paganism, to Christianity. Uh, the Christian sources, as we've seen in the case of Peter Mongus, in the case of Theophilus, in the case of uh, Macedonius and, and so on, uh, tend to present these, these um, transitions uh, as violent and sudden uh, and as a supernatural conflict between the divine powers of the Christians and the demonic powers uh, of uh, the, um, uh, the old gods. Uh, the Christian sources uh, that describe these processes are written in such a way as to highlight the holiness and spirituality of um, uh, Christian leaders who are heroic figures. Um, they are figures who are um, exemplary. They are their, their holiness is is so powerful um, that their actions just demonstrate how how powerful their holiness is. So bishops of Alexandria like Theophilus. Uh, and Peter Mongus show their holiness by rooting out and destroying um, uh, the remnants of paganism. That's also the case for local bishops like Macedonius, uh, who is associated with the story of the, uh, the mass conversion of Philae. It's also um, uh, true on a, a slightly smaller scale of individuals like the monk Macarius um, exercising the demons uh, inside uh, the mummy case that he decides to use uh, as a pillow. Um, so the stories themselves, they have a logic, um, they have a rationale, which perhaps doesn't really map on to the to what was probably going on uh, in uh, these uh, communities. And the fact that we have these contradictory stories being told about Philae uh, points to that very clearly. Uh, the stories that we get in these Christian sources needs to be uh, uh, they need to be treated with a certain amount of caution in that the other evidence that we have suggests that there certainly is suppression and we can see this in the defacing of the temple images and we can see also that there is this sort of distinctive Egyptian feature which is the obliteration particularly of the feet. Uh, even so um, the transformation that we have uh, perhaps was a bit more patchy and gradual. It may be the case that one of the reasons why um, uh, it is eventually possible in the 6th century uh, to uh, convert the temple at Philae into a Christian church was that it had already lain abandoned uh, for a number of decades. In other words, it was a nice big building in which you could put a church, although one precautionary measure that you had to, uh, had to make was to get rid of any surviving pagan images and to impose Christian images in their place. Um, thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much for that, Mark. It's really nice to 
kind of have the texts to go along with the images, which are just so widespread when you go around the temples in Egypt today, whether it's the Ptolemaic ones or even the earlier 18th, 19th and 20th dynasty ones. So uh, thank you very much for that. I was thinking when you were, you showed one of the texts in which you mentioned uh, Isadora, which is quite a common name in the, in the Greco-Roman world and mm -hmm. obviously surviving, I think, there to the 5th century. Mm -hmm. and, and the text that you mentioned it more for was for the, the persecution of, uh, of the, the pagan gods, etc. But the, 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 the name Isadora means, um, uh, what is it, uh, life, the, the, the gift of Isis. Mm -hmm. So did they not have a problem with the fact that Isis was invoked in the name? Or do you think at that stage it had probably lost its meaning altogether? Uh this is the um, sorry. Hold on. I just go. It's it's the the uh, the law. Um, it's I think wasn't it the the law of the emperors? Um, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so this one, the law to Isidorus. Yeah. Um, it, it is. It is odd. Um, the um, I mean, a, a lot of these names are theophoric. They have the name of a of a. Um, of of a, a pagan god in them, um, and in in some cases you do see that as being a problem. I mean, the fact that you have the story told about Macedonius at Philae when he can when he baptizes the um, uh, the priest of the temple, he gives him um, a baptismal name. He calls him Jacob. Mm -hmm. um, so there you get a, a, a renaming. But um, so many of these names seem to have been um, uh, sort of you know, traditional family names and um, uh, that they're, they're sort of pagan associations um, uh, don't seem to have been um, uh, something that they really worried about. Mm. Um, I mean, you have um, in the seventh century in Spain, I mean, one of the most famous authors of the of the early medieval period is Isidore of Seville, whose name is Isidorus. Um, so that's um, uh, an indication that those names, you, you have, um, you know, they're uh, uh, you know, a Christian bishop with a, a Christian writer uh, with one of these Theophoric names. Um, you, um, you do have um, alternative names uh, that are being used, you know, uh, Theophilus, for example, you know, the God-loving one. Um, uh, an earlier bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, which is uh, all about you know, um, uh, uh, conquering death. Uh, you know, rise. It's a name associated with the resurrection. Um, but uh, you also have some quite surprising names for for Christian for Christians. My favourite Christian from the whole of this period is a bishop of Cagliari uh, in Sardinia from the three fifties. Um, whose name is Lucifer. So I like the idea of a Bishop Lucifer uh, of Cagliari. Uh, he, he, he writes the most angry um, denunciations of his uh, religious opponents. So it's quite an appropriate name. Was that his proper name as well? That's That seems to be his proper name. Uh, I've never done enough, uh, I've never looked into it. It'd be quite easy to do looking at the databases to work out, out how many Christian Lucifers there are from mm. this period. Can't imagine there's too many. <laughs> It's 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 a name which seems to have fallen from favour. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, we've had quite a few questions come through, so I will work my way through them. They can through to me privately. Perhaps Sam got some as well. So the first one we've got here by Mark has asked: Were the Egyptian gods seen as being more dangerous, as they could no longer read hieroglyphs, unlike the gods of the Greek and Roman world? Yeah, um, uh, that's probably quite quite a good point. I mean, the um, I mean, the appearance of the of of the Egyptian gods is is something that is regarded as pretty outlandish. I mean, the, the fact that you have the, the mention of the of the various animals in that text from um, uh, in connection with uh, Paralius at, at Manuthus, you know, the reference to the you know, the crocodiles, the dogs, the cats, and stuff like that. Um, that actually is something that goes goes uh, that that caused the Egyptian gods to be regarded with um, uh, with a certain amount of reserve, even by other other pagans. 
Um, there's a famous bit in um, Virgil's Aeneid, for example, where he's where he there's, there's this bit in the Aeneid where they sort of give you a sort of sneak preview of of future Roman history. I mean, it's of course written looking back, but it's it's as if it's you know at the very beginning of Rome. There's this sort of prediction uh, of um, of Roman history. Uh, and one of the events that it describes is this. Um, uh, is the Battle of Actium this 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 um, this confrontation between Cleopatra um, and the future Roman Emperor Augustus, and it describes it as a sort of cosmic battle between the um, Roman gods and these very outlandish um, uh, Egyptian gods. It it, it talks about um, uh, the Barker Anubis, uh, for example, at this point. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, the forgetting or not not being able to read the text, I think that that is probably important. I mean, as I say, there is um, uh, evidence suggesting that down to the fourth and fifth centuries, they are able to read, uh, or some people are able to read some of these texts. But it is quite clear that an awful lot of people hadn't the foggiest idea uh, what some of these what these texts mean. And it's interesting that in that. Uh, account um, given by uh, Zacharias Scholasticus. It's just this idea that they they are pagan symbols. These these, these hieroglyphics. There is a, there was a recent book which I'm afraid I've not yet read on Christian attitudes to hieroglyphs, um, uh, uh, which discusses this in detail. Um, uh, but um, it, it is clear that some people uh, really don't understand uh, what these things mean. I mean there's, there's, there's a, a Roman historian from the end of the fourth century called uh, Ammianus Marcellinus, who gives what he claims is a translation of hieroglyphs from an obelisk that has been set up in Rome. It's the, the one which now stands outside um, the church of St John Lateran uh, in Rome. It was originally set up in the in, in the Circus Maximus in Rome. And he gives he says here yeah, that, that it's covered in these in these. Um, uh, these Egyptian characters, and he proposed to give a, uh, a translation of it. Now I can't read, um, you know, hieroglyphics at all. But I'm told that by people who can that the translation he offers is total nonsense. It's entirely made up. Um, uh, 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 and, and in it, and the fact that he was able to get get away with that suggests, yeah, people don't really understand. Certainly outside Egypt, people don't understand uh, what these what these uh, what these texts mean. So I think actually the fact that they that yeah, the, that they're associated with these sort of strange texts may um, uh, indeed indicate that the Egyptian gods are regarded as with, with greater reserve. But uh, as I say, there is this new book uh, on uh, Christians and hieroglyphics, and I, and I, need, to, I need to look at that to, to see what it says. Sorry not to have done so so far. Sounds like as long as you say it with conviction, people will believe you. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so if you say, oh, this is what it means, yeah, you can get away. For the with obelisk, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, I think is that, that might be my daughter on her way to bed. Yeah, my daughter on her way. There'll, there'll be a slight interruption. Hold on. <laughs> Quick couple. <laughs> oh, no, sweetheart. You're going to be a good girl and have a good sleep. <laughs> Oh, right, okay. Right, okay. There we go. Oh. Not much, sweetheart. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this right. evening I'm, I, I'm doing this rather than the very hungry caterpillar. Maybe the <laughs> very hungry caterpillar would be much more fun. <laughs> so the next question is asking if there's uh, sufficient evidence to suggest that a particular Egyptian a set of images were targeted in preference to others, uh, which were considered perhaps to not have more influence over the, uh, the, the pagan population than others, for example, uh, would be interested to, to muse on which particular Egyptian gods were more of a challenge to Christianity than others, if there were any, mm. was there any particular hierarchy? That's a really interesting, I mean, that's a really interesting question, um, which makes me feel slightly guilty about responding I don't know <laughs> but it's it's a really really good question um are there some that they regarded as um as um 
as worse. No, that's that's a really interesting question. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I wonder do they target more the ones that have heads of animals rather than hmm. anthropomorphic heads, for example? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the images that you provided me with, Ken, from uh, that that um, gate in um, in um, Karnak. In Karnak. Uh, I mean, they just went. I mean, they went with it with some some gusto, uh, and and you know, I mean, the way that they went about it mm. can't have been easy. I mean, they needed to get. I mean, they did it all the way from ground level, yeah, all the way up to the top. I mean, they 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 they, um, uh, they went at it with with great gusto, um, and and it's just everything there. I mean, there there are of course other ones with. Uh, is it Min who's the uh, the Athenian yeah. one? They 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 certainly. Go at us! Uh, they they go beyond the the head, hands, and feet. There, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, whether it's the animal, I mean, the, I, I suppose the animal ones. Um, I suppose it's easier to imagine those as, uh, or easier to to say though to to imagine those as demonic. Although demons can take all sorts of forms uh, mm. in these uh, in these Christian texts. Um, I mean, uh, some of the texts which relate to, for example, monks. Um, in the in the desert, talk about them being visited by by visions of demons, which take on the form uh, taking on the form of an alluring woman is quite a, a popular one. Um, so, uh, but it, it may well be the case that you know it's easier to imagine uh, these uh, animal headed things as sort of as, as sort of monstrous and demonic. But um, uh, I'm afraid uh, again, I'm showing my my ignorance of of um, of, of Egyptian things, I, I, it'd be quite fun to do a sort of inventory of these things. Ken, you must have a the makings, be, of a, makings of a database. Quite here. a study that, because <laughs> <laughs> not only do they do they target the the full images, but you often see hieroglyphs as well that are uh, completely yes, yeah. deliberately erased, and they seem to yeah. be specifically targeted ones, such yeah. as obviously. Um, you see some animals that are raised, but also those especially that have uh, depictions of deities as hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I think that's, which, which suggests that they probably know what these things still mean. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or somebody knows what they mean, or, or somebody has made a lucky guess, I don't know. We did have a comment in the chat, somebody has suggested, could the hands and feet have been destroyed to symbolise Jesus on the cross, since they're targeting these areas? Um, it, uh, I mean that's possible. Uh, I can't remember uh, exactly. Read uh, the destruction of hands and feet. I think is sometimes seen in pre pre question things as well, where things are attacked. Uh, I would need to look in at the bibliography in more detail, but there is um, uh, a reference uh, to at least one stealer which where uh, hands and feet have been destroyed. And this is about the 13th century BCE uh, or something like that. But uh, it may well be that, you know, hands and feet are perhaps um, have that significance. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be mentioned in the in the sources if it is the case. Uh, there does seem to uh, the such scholarship as I've read on this seems to suggest it's just the hands are where they they exercise their, you know, that's you know, through which they exercise their power, and um, uh, and the feet is what enables them to move around. So you're so you're so you're obliterating the face, which is the 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 image of the god. You're obliterating the hands that enable them to um, uh, uh, to you know, carry out demonic activities, and also you're root, you're you're preventing them from moving around. I quite like the idea of preventing them from moving around. Which we've also had a comment about actually in a lot of the hieroglyphs, if it's an animal sign, they will put a little slash through the body to stop it coming too large right. or okay. moving about. So whether that's that brilliant. Yeah, that's happens. really interesting. Really interesting, yeah. And, and connected to that as well in the pre-Christian things, during the Ptolemaic period, images of Seth were often uh, destroyed. Yeah. Uh, in particular, they, they would target the feet, the hands and the, yeah. and, the and the face. Yeah. So it does seem to be very much mm -hmm. unconnected to Jesus on the cross. I would all right, say. that's yeah. All right, okay. Th that thanks for uh, uh, for that. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, uh, and of course you know the obliteration of images is not a purely an Egyptian thing. I mean, you get it uh, in other cultures as well. You know, this sort of uh, you know, erasure of of the memory uh, of someone. You get some really spectacular yeah. examples uh, in Roman culture uh, of you know 
faces being hacked, faces being removed from things, or whole figures being removed from uh, from from sculptural reliefs uh, and things like that. So yeah. you just even have to look back at Akhenaten. Yeah, yeah, is another another BC and, and his persecution of the mm -hmm. of the gods, where he mm -hmm. often erased not just the hands, feet, and mm -hmm. face, although sometimes, but also the full figures. Yeah, and you do get the erasure of full figures uh, from some of these Ptolemaic ones. You, I remember you. I think some of the ones from Philae, the, mm -hmm. the 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 whole figure has been has been erased, sort of, you know, quite high up on these on these uh, temple pylons. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, the, the hand, the hand, uh, the face, hands, and feet thing. I mean, is is particularly interesting in, in, in the context of this sort of element of. Yeah, this is this. Yeah, when when they when they have a go at an image in Egypt, this is how they go about doing it, yeah. uh, rather than, you know, with with Germanicus just making him look like he's he's been to some sort of polite Ash <laughs> Wednesday <laughs> service. So the next question we have is uh, apparently. Um, Hypatia attracted international scholars to Alexandria. Is there mm. any memorial for for her there? Uh, you mean a uh, a modern memorial uh, for her, or well, um, ancient? I don't. Know. Oh, ancient. Um, I mean, the, the story is. Um, it's interesting, actually, the way that the story is is told about Hypatia. Uh, a lot of our sources for it come from Christian authors, um, and and uh, one of them in particular is written from the perspective of. Uh, somebody in Constantinople who really didn't like Cyril of Alexandria and thought that Cyril of Alexandria was a massive thug, uh, mainly because Cyril of Alexandria had a uh, um, uh, serious rivalry with the with the the, the church at Constantinople, and, and it tells the story of of high of Hypatia basically as a way of showing what a thug. Um, uh, uh, Cyril of Alexandria uh, is, and that, you have to bear in mind this is another Christian uh, writing about um, uh, about about her. In terms of uh, so, most of our sources are Christian, but there is there, there are some uh, pagan writings. There, there is one work. There's a there's a guy uh, called Damascius, um, probably from the sixth century, so the early five hundreds. Uh, writes a work called the life of Isidora. So there's another one of these uh, these uh, uh, theophoric names. And Isidorus was a um, a pagan philosopher at Alexandria, and he mentions uh, the the death of of Hypatia. Now I need to check the text, which I haven't done for a while, but uh, I think my sense is that it it he locates the death of Hypatia. Uh, in the context of just urban upheavals. Now, Alexandria was a huge, ha had this reputation for being this incredibly violent city. Uh, and anyone who encouraged violence, you know, it really was like lighting the touch paper. You just didn't know how bad things were going to get in Alexandria uh, if, if you did that. Uh, and it see, I, th I think it, it, it says that there were, uh, that, that what happened was that Cyril created this sort of febrile atmosphere in Alexandria um, and, um, uh, and and that's what caused the death of, of Hypatia. What it does tell us is that Hy is that it does commemorate uh, Hypatia uh, Hypatia's activities as as a scholar. Um, it commemorates her activities editing texts um, and also editing texts uh, together with her father Theon. Um, unfortunately, the with this text, because it's written by a pagan in this sort of rather uh, contentious atmosphere of pagan rivalry with, Christi with Christians, the whole text doesn't survive, but we have fairly extensive fragments of it, which were quoted by later authors, mainly because they were interested in the language that this work was using rather than particular stories. But we do have um, uh, evidence that that her, that her death was commemorated uh, by by some pagans as um, uh, uh, an indication of, of, of the sort of horrific thing that horrific things that pagans at Alexandria were having to put up with. Uh, and similarly, we have the death commemorated, interestingly, by Christians, um, some of whom are, are doing it because they want to show that 
Cyril's a bit of a thug. But in the case of John of Nicu that we looked at um, in the slides, uh, he he just wants to see Cyril as the worthy successor of Theophilus. You know, as Theophilus starts off this purge of paganism, Cyril brings it to an end. So you have so you can have Christian views which are favourable. You can have pagan views which are unfavourable, but you can also have Christian views that are that are unfavourable. So that I mean the story is 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 um, is remembered. I think would be the uh, uh, the crucial thing. So 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 yes, Hypatia is memorialized uh, in these texts. Uh, the next question is asking if there's evidence that temple reliefs were plastered over and redecorated with Christian images and did this help protect the older inscriptions? And you'd probably know the answer to that better than me. I think. Well, like, I, I'm thinking of one specifically <laughs> yeah. um, that you have, and it's actually quite a, quite an interesting one. At uh, I think it's at Wadi El Sabua in mm. in um, uh, Lower Nubia, and mm. it's quite interesting because the they've only plastered over part of the area, and yeah. they've put a, a painting of Saint Peter. Yeah, on there, oh, the right. image of Ramesses the second. Mm -hmm. So Ramesses the second is making an offering to Saint Peter, which is oh, that's fun. that's um, yeah, uh, that's playing around with the chronology. Right? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> they, they were clearly playing around a little bit. But yeah, um, I mean, you have, I mean, I mean, in terms of what the texts tell us, it's it's, um, I mean, we know that sometimes these these images, I mean. It, Procopius says that talks about images being sent to Constantinople and we do know that images of gods were set up in in Constantinople which given that it's supposed to be a Christian city set up by a Christian emperor for a Christian empire seems like a rather odd thing to do in some cases it might simply be that they were sort of monuments to past error or simply that they were just nice bits of art to look at uh, but in terms of the uh, of uh, I mean you have for example from Philae you have the a very deliberate um, uh, carving of the cross on the face of Isis on the on the on the, on the door jam uh, leading into the into the temple. Um, I, I suppose yeah, if, if things weren't visible, maybe they didn't worry about them too much. And also, we have to bear in mind that you know, in addition to dealing with these things and dealing with these sorts of things and getting rid of these things, the Christians also spent an awful lot of time worrying about each other and about other types of Christians that they didn't that they didn't agree with. So they were spending as much time fighting each other as they were, yeah. they were just getting rid of these of these pagan things. But yeah, there is this sort of uh, deliberate um, effort to sort of. Um, you know, sort of bury thing. We do we do hear about things being buried, or we, we I mean there have been um, examples of um, pagan uh, cult images buried, um, and the question is were they buried by pagans in the hope that they could come back to them? Perhaps like, a bit like those ones at Manuthas, um, or are they um, buried um, by Christians destroying the um, destroying the sanctuaries? There's a a collection of images from the Temple of Mithras in London um, and it looks like I think I remember reading once that the um, the images look like they didn't all come from one temple they, they may have come from a number of different temples but it isn't clear whether they were whether this was um, Christians burying them and Yabu sucks to them <laughs> or whether it was uh, some pagans say right let's bury these before the before the Christians get their pesky hands on them and and do untold damage to them. We don't know in, in some cases. Uh, but yeah, I like the idea of things being plastered over. I mean, of course, I suppose a lot of that, what we'd know about that would depend on on, on preservation, which... And there's there's also a Luxor temple, although mm -hmm. not Christian, but um, uh, Islamic, where you have the temple there, right. which is, of course, uh, that has the mosque that is built on top of the temple, yes. and they plastered over a lot of reliefs there. Oh and yes, yes. Fifteen yeah. years or so ago, there was a fair, and they were refurbishing it and had to remove a lot of the plaster, which revealed all of these pharaonic reliefs, which oh, nobody had seen in hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, and about that was quite about fourteen, yeah, about in about thirteen hundred years, probably the first time yeah, those yeah, things exactly. have been seen. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is the um, you know what, what impact then the the arrival of of Islam has on on this. I mean, I think a lot of these sites have already been fairly. Um, uh, fairly extensively knocked about by the Christians before the, the Muslim Arabs. 
Yeah. Even so long. I did just just find the picture as well from Wadia Saboa. So I'm going to share it on here so oh, that cool. people can find it. If I can find the browser that I have with a million windows open. Um, it's just the drawing of it that uh, was done. But uh, it's quite quite funny where you've got the niche, which instead of having the image of the deity, uh, that should be sharing now, hopefully. It has uh, Ramesses presenting offerings on either side. To, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Very clever that's of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, it also shows a certain amount of... Um, uh, oh, thank you, Luis. Uh, um, also, she has a certain amount of aesthetic um, taste on the on the on the part of the of the Christians. The way that they've there's a sort of neat symmetry mm. uh, <laughs> going on there. Um, and hey, that's 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 super. So this is this is from the Temple of Wadi El Sabua, which is now oh, right, excellent. Public just to the north of, uh, of Abu Simbel, which I'm sure people... Oh, have. right. Mm. Yeah, quite interesting. Plenty I need, to, I, I need to go back after, whatever it was, 35... Yeah, be about 35 years since I was there. I know the mosque in, in, in Luxor well because I've got... Uh, I remember doing a pencil sketch of it. Do you have any more questions, Sam? There's lots of messages of thanks to you, Mark, because this isn't a topic that we normally cover in Egyptology land. So lots of people have learned lots and lots today. So thank you very, very much. Well, uh, and there's also been a, a request. Is there any further reading you could recommend? Yes. Uh, what I could do, Sam, is I've got a list of further reading, which I could send you and then you could distribute to the list. With that, that would be fantastic. I can email out tomorrow when I send the yeah. recording through to people. Yeah, I've and Arthur's also asked for the name, the title of the book on the Christians' attitudes to hieroglyphs. I, I will, I, I, I've got it. Have I haven't yet read it, but I'll put that on the reading list as Did well. You say it's a book or an article? It's, it's a book. Oh, it's, it's a book. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, I don't know Fantastic. that one. Sounds good. Okay. And I... That's everything I've got in the chat, apart from lots of thank yous. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. If, if I did miss anything, do do post in the in the chat and uh, we're still here. We can we can uh, pass them on to Mark. But thank you very much to everybody. Um, Leah, lots of comments of thank you and stuff like that. So uh, for everyone who is here, we will be sending the recording to people, hopefully tomorrow at some point once the processing of that has finished. So you can you can watch it again if you want to. Uh, and a big thank you to Mark for giving, giving this lecture in support of the Egypt Centre and the Friends uh, group as well. So we're very, very grateful. And it's nice to, nice to see you as well. In, uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, we can go to JC's for a few beers. We, can, we certainly can. Um, it's very difficult to drink through a mask at the moment, I think. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. Although if anybody would find a way, I'm sure you would, Mark. Uh, well, yeah, I'd rise to the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank thanks you again, much. everyone, for attending tonight. And thanks to Mark thank and Sam as well. And hopefully see you all soon. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.